What's up? I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour, and I was proudly raised on the era of consequence-free childhood violence stories. You got the X-Men and the Avengers. Nobody ever really gets hurt in that stuff. Star Wars, yeah, people get hurt, but their wound is immediately cauterized with a little orange circle by this. The after-school stuff, G.I. Joe, nobody ever gets shot. Transformers, you shoot them, so what? They're robots, they're metal. You just fix the metal lately. And Further, there's one more story that was largely consequence-free that I was raised around every week, and that's the one I got on Sunday mornings, which is the Old Testament. I remember learning about Noah's Ark, and they had big paintings of Noah's Ark, this giant mural on the wall of maybe my kindergarten or first grade Sunday school room, and the giraffes had googly eyes and long necks, and all the animals are smiling, and everybody's happy, and there were no bloated human carcasses floating around outside the boat, ever, not even one. I stared at that mural forever. Additionally, I remember when we did the flannel gram presentation with David and Goliath, and David bravely fights Goliath. It's great. It's a really important story. But there was no moment where Edith got out a big giant pool of red blood and put it under Goliath's headless body as David triumphantly stands above him with his severed head. Nothing, nothing like that at all. It was all sanitized, just like all of these stories were sanitized. And I'm not making the case here that we should horrify our children way more by exposing them to violent, terrible things at a younger age. What I am saying is that very appropriate adult impulse to expose us to the beginnings of the frictions of the world without getting us into all of the gritty stuff can cause it to be quite the surprise when we grow up a little bit and we discover there's a lot of very gritty stuff in all of these beloved stories, and especially the Bible. You go through this and you read this with your fresh adult eyes when you start doing the faith thing for yourself. And it's mortifying because you go through and, and you're conditioned to be like, well, I mean, the good guys, the point of view characters are always right because that's how all my stories are. I, I see the world through Duke and Snake Eyes and the good guys. I see the world through the eyes of Optimus Prime and Luke Skywalker and Captain America. And so they're right because you're conditioned. Point of view equals morally right, the good guy. But the Bible doesn't work like that. It's ambiguous and violent and weird and not a little violent. Horrifyingly violent. Wholesale violence for pages on end. And there might not be pictures in the Bible of it all going down. But if you start thinking about it, it raises questions that go beyond, well, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? And right into how is God? And what's the deal with this document? What do we do with all of this violence? And why is it even there in the first place? In this video, I want to break down those two questions. Why is there violence in the Bible? And what do we do with it? I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's get after it. I got five reasons rattling around in my head here for why I think there's violence in the Bible. But before I get into each one of those one at a time here, I want to just make sure that we totally understand that I don't imagine for a second that you watching a quick YouTube video on this or that me making a quick YouTube video on this just makes the tension go away or resolves it. You're probably going to wrestle with this for a while because violence is a pretty freaky thing and it's okay if this feels weighty. I just want to process it through together. So the first reason, in light of all that, that I think there's violence in the Bible is because there's violence in the world and tons of it. Now, the Bible claims to cover a span of several thousand years at minimum. And let's just think for a minute about the amount of violence that would happen if we just hit the high points of, say, your lifetime. Well, it would be a shocking amount of violence because shocking things have happened within living memory of you and me. Now imagine that we're taking the most newsworthy bits spread out over several thousand years and condensing it down into uh, it's Philippians, only about that much space. There's a pretty good chance that you're going to find a little bit of violence every few pages. And sure enough, you do. So reason number one that there's violence in the Bible is because there's violence everywhere. And the Bible is a book that claims to be rooted in reality, happening in actual history with actual people at actual times. So unsurprisingly, it looks like the rest of history. A second reason I think we see violence in the Bible, and particularly in the older parts of the Old Testament, is that the age of nomadism at this moment in history is pretty much over. Nomads, uh, tribes or families or clans, used to run long circuits over the course of multiple years where they would hunt and gather, they'd let the land replenish, and they'd hit it the next time around on their loop. Well, gradually, the ancient Near East 
stops doing that. And more and more people develop agricultural techniques and they have to protect those fields. Gradually, walls go up, kings and city-states evolve, and it disrupts the flow of those nomadic treks, those nomadic paths. And so around the time of the Exodus, we see nomads falling off the grid or being pushed to the extreme fringes of society, a process that keeps duplicating itself throughout history so that today nomads only exist in a few tiny little corners of the world. Well, the Israelites were nomads. After the Exodus, they're wandering around out in the desert with a million plus people. They got to go somewhere. So either they're going to die or somebody else is going to die. Now, I'm not saying I want anybody to die or that I feel good about it. What I am pointing out is that there is a historical moment and a historical pressure being put on people by resources and the evolution of history that makes this conflict, this violence, a lot more inevitable than we might imagine today as we think of conquest in light of how horrifying it would be if Canada just decided that they wanted to conquer Guatemala and went and invaded it and killed everybody and slaughtered every last person and took over their cities. Oh, gross. Why? We have the resources to make everything work. That's just crazy aggression. Morally, I think it is a little different thing that was going on in this unique moment in the history of the world as nomadism is on the way out and landedness becomes a requirement for your continued existence as a people. A third reason there's a bunch of violence in the Bible is because people are dumb and they do dumb things. And tons of the violence we see in the Bible is never condoned by God. A bunch of it is even condemned by God and actively punished by God. But some of the weirdest violent stories in the Old Testament are ambiguous. It's just an account of somebody being an idiot. Jephthah is this guy in Judges chapter 11 who's like, all right, God, I'm going to go conquer these people on your behalf. And God's like, yep, you're going to, you're going to win. He's like, I'm doing a vow to you. After I win, whatever comes out the door to meet me, I'm going to sacrifice it to you. And God's like, he doesn't say anything. But then this Jephthah fellow goes home and of course his kid comes out. And so he does it. This is a horrifying story in Judges 11, but never is there like, and God was super happy because he totally wanted Jephthah to do that. No, God just goes silent. He ghosts Jephthah at that point. And you can be like, oh, well, that makes God a jerk because he should have talked Jephthah out of it. But there's all kinds of debate that we could have there. But the bottom line is a ton of the violence in the Old Testament just happens because people do rash, crazy things. And of course, the rasher and the crazier, the more clicks. And that's the stuff that's going to get preserved and that we're going to remember. But then a fourth reason there's a bunch of violence in the Bible is because sometimes God, who holds himself out as being flawless and infinite and the knower of all things and absolutely morally right, even if he does things that you and I aren't allowed to do, at times decides that he wants to be violent, that he wants to judge people, that he wants to kill people. I don't like it. I'm not for it. It's not my call. I don't want to do it. I don't think people doing it in the name of God is a particularly good idea. Generally speaking, I fall on the pacifist side of the equation. But if there were an entity who knew all things and was right about everything and he wanted to judge things or mess with things in the world he owns and a creation that is his, I guess that would be his business, whether my opinions align with it or not. Of course, another perspective on this is to say, well, there is no God and this whole thing is nonsense and people are just using a deity to justify horrible behavior. Well, yes and no. The text at times, though, describes God as supernaturally carrying these things out. So it's not all just then some people were like, I think God wants us to go conquer that town and kill those people. There's some of that, but there's also things like this in Joshua chapter 10. In verse 11, we got this fight against the Amorites and everything's coming unraveled and the Israelites are going to win. It says, as they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah. Okay, so the human element of the violence is carried out at the behest of God. It would appear, at least, the general impulse toward conquest, but now it gets carried out by God himself. The Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky and more of them died from the hailstones then were killed by the swords of the Israelites. So at the very least, we say it was a crazy coincidence in the middle of a battle. There's gigantic racquetball sized hail and it murders a whole bunch of soldiers from one team, but none from the other team. I guess that theoretically could be a thing that could happen. A crazy coincidence, but it could. But the text credits this to God and the text isn't like, I'm super sorry. 
I'm so sorry that God seems really mean in this passage, but he did use hail and he did. I guess just like, nope, he did that. And God is assumed to be right within the text. So look, there's no getting around it. Of course, the impulse is there in this day and age to want to apologize for God and make him look better. But the text doesn't apologize for God. It holds him out as a judge who is entitled to judge when he wants to judge. And if you find that horrifying, well, then that is something we have in common. The Bible also says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So maybe there's something to that, which actually gets me to my fifth point. The fifth reason I think there's a bunch of violence in the Bible is because it's describing a theological reality, a broken setting into which God is stepping to redeem the situation. One of the things I love about George R.R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire books is that they are very gritty. And what you get is the sense that this Westeros place is a disaster and that the monarchy they have and that the ethics and rules they have are broken. This does not work. And because you keep getting more glimpses of how broken it is, you more want a good king or good government or some kind of reform to come along to redeem this mess that you still see the potential in them. I mean, you care about the characters, their glimpses of beauty, but you're dying for redemption. I think that's the effect of the Old Testament. The violence is there to paint a picture of the theological ruin that is present in humanity. And the later prophet Micah in Micah chapter seven speaks to this. He says, the godly have been swept from the land. Not one upright man remains. All men lie in wait to shed blood. Each hunts his brother with a net. Blood, or rather both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright, worse than a thorn hedge. Yeah, it's an ugly description of how things are. But if the description is true, if the shoe fits, then well, telling the truth about that all the more points to what happens in this part of the document where God ramps up the redemptive effort to take that which really is broken and in need of fixing and to fix it and redeem it. All right, so inarguably, we've got a bunch of violence in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. There might be good reasons for that. I just threw out five that I think are pretty good explanations for why it's there. But that leaves us with one more question, and that is, what do we do with it? Here are some things that maybe we can do with it. Option number one, pretend it's not there. Just assume that those parts of the Bible are inaccurate or poorly recorded or translated and just pretend they're not there, but then still like the rest of the Bible. I don't think that works because... The text tradition says these words have always been in the Bible. As long as we've had access to these books of the Bible, I don't think we can pretend they're not there. They are there. The people who wrote it were not ashamed to write it. They meant to write it. So I don't think that's a great way to respond. I think we have to deal with this one way or another. Another option for what we do with all of this violence is to minimize it. Maybe I did a little bit of that with the point that I just made a minute ago about, oh, well, there's just violence during this time and the nomads are going away. Maybe we take that even further and we're like, oh, it's just, you know, God was just judging people who were bad. The Canaanites were really bad people. They burned their babies to death intentionally alive at the hands of a, a idol named Molech. They were horrible. They had it coming. Just find ways to make it so that we don't have to think about it or worry about it. I think that's better than the first option in terms of what to do with it. But I think you might ultimately find that to be a little bit unsatisfactory as well. A third option for what to do with it is be angry. I mean, like I, I could never worship a God who would do that. That's kind of a funny equation, isn't it? Because where did you get your morality from? Is there some code of morality that is inherent in natural law? Most people don't think that anymore. I, I do, but most people don't believe that. They think everything is relative. So where did we get the morality with which to be morally outraged at God? Oh, we got it from God. <laughs> so if he's in charge of that, it's a little bit tricky to do the chicken and the egg thing with this question. And further, if we get angry and we ask the question like, why is there so much violence in the Bible? Why does God like violence so much? I think a really fair question to bounce back at us is, why do we like violence so much? Maybe it's for some of the same reasons. I mean, we like violence to push back on injustice, right? If people are doing bad things, we want there to be justice. Maybe you have to use force to stop people from doing the bad things. Well, that's a reason you like violence. Some of the time, at least, it seems like 
That is why God is employing violence. Uh, another reason that we like violence is because we need to get people in line so they'll participate in the system. Well, at least at times, violence is employed for that same reason. You just might not have the same values as the system here, but maybe in your mind, you're like, it's okay if it's my system. So uh, there again, that anger seems a little bit misdirected. No, if anything, our love, and I do mean our love for violence societally, seems to be a little bit more reckless and unfocused and unprincipled than the way God employs violence in the text. So if we want to do the I'm angry at God because there's violence in the Bible, which maybe is a valid thing to do, I mean, first we kind of have to remove the log from our own eye and renounce and reject all violence. I don't want to kill babies or old people or foreigners or criminals. I don't want to kill anybody. I want to do violence toward people. I don't want to make people do my things through the force of the state. And I don't want to go out and hurt people who hurt me. No more eye for an eye. I mean, you really have to be willing to take a long look at every expression of violence or even possible expression of violence in order to have a consistent footing to push back on God's use of violence here. Maybe that's a little bit different if you're pushing back on the human uses of violence, but I don't know. I think the be angry at God response is emotionally valid, but ultimately gets us to a bit of a dead end as well. Another option, and this might be the one that I've come to, is roll with it. I hinted at this earlier in the video. I'll spell it out more now. If there's a deity who knows everything, is infinite, and is right about everything, is morally right in all of his judgments, and he does stuff I don't like... Okay, uh, I don't have a leg to stand on because I am not right about everything. I'm, I'm wrong about most things. So I suppose the other option there would be to say, yeah, I'm going to roll with it, writing this all off as a non-deity who didn't actually order any of these things. And all of the supernatural claims about God judging, those couldn't be real because there's no God, in which case God is kind of off the hook. And it's a way that both the theist and the non-theist can come together and say, yeah, we just roll with it. This is just how the story works. The theist saying, because if God is perfect, that's what he does. The non-theist saying, because this is just people doing stuff and there's no God behind it at all. What I will say is this. The one thing we definitely cannot do with it is imitate it. Is say, eh, I'm pretty sure because of this story from a few thousand years back that God would want me to kill these people now. Or, uh, I'm pretty sure that I'm so right morally about things and that I know how all the things ought to be in society that I should break other people's stuff and kill them if they won't play along. Well, I'm pretty sure that violence in the service of my rightness and excellence and my team's victory is definitely good. And don't pretend for a minute that that kind of flawed reasoning isn't something that all segments of society are tempted to give into. Left, right, Big government, small government, Christian people, not Christian people. Everybody is very susceptible to being convinced that God or some notion of inarguable truth is on our side. And if we run over some other people and hurt them on the way to this inarguable truth, well, they should have got out of the way or got on board with the thing that was right. Should have got on board with the right side of history. So I think the one thing we can take from this is that if we're troubled at all by the violence we see there and we're not quite sure what to do with it, it can have a humbling effect on us and we can step back from violence and say, ah, it's something I'd want to be really, really careful with because if it causes that much discomfort for me when I see it from a distance, how much more so might it cause me discomfort or even worse things if I embrace it for myself? Bottom line is the Bible is not this consequence-free violence that just cutely happens in ways that are neatly packaged up for kids. You look deep, you see there's actual bloodshed, there's actual hurt. It's a very grown-up document with very real consequences, and that is going to agitate you and me, and I think that's okay. Hopefully, it's fruitful for us to put our heads together and think about why it's there, what it means, and what we do with it as well. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.